All right. So good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Ayanna Polk. I'm the Director of Community Partnerships here at Vital Connections, a health equity nonprofit here in Boston who look to bring community and you know every member of the health ecosystem together to make quality solutions. So uh, a part of that mission is that we come together every month and talk about different topics that are point of mind for us that are really important that sometimes we may not know who to ask or how to start to, to have this journey with our health. But um, for this month, we wanted to make sure with it being um, Nutrition Awareness Month that we talked about food justice because health really does start with what we put in our bodies. But we understand that the, the journey and the access to those, those food items is different for everyone, especially in a city that's ever changing. So we're really excited tonight to have four wonderful people that are in the food justice and nutrition and food access space to really have a conversation about how we um, find healthy options in our city, what does it look like for us to advocate for that access, and you know how can we continue our food journeys to include um, healthy and culturally um, competent options. So I know I'm excited to lean into this conversation. So I want to take a pause there um, and just kind of get us ready to have the community convo. So um, next slide, please. So when it comes to talking about food justice, we'll be looking at um, these four tenants right here on the screen, which is talking about you know, making sure that we can reduce our food waste because we want to think about our footprint in the future, supporting Boston's rec restaurants and food economy because that's really important to make sure that we're keeping healthy options open throughout every neighborhood in Boston, um, thinking about our own relationships with food and what that means because um, I know that there's a lot of conversation about, you know, the emotional pieces around how we how we engage with food and what our when our diet looks like. And then fourth and most important is food insecurity, because we understand with the rising prices of, of, of living in Boston, food insecurity is on the rise. And we want to make sure that through these, through that and the three other points that are on the screen, that we're really taking a stand to make sure that we can still have access to healthy options throughout Boston. So that is a quick overview just to kind of set the stage but I know that we have um, some great experts that I know I want to share the floor with someone that I know could give us a deeper dive into what is food justice because it's in her office title. So um, I'm going to pass it off to the new de deputy director of the mayor's office of food justice, Melissa Honeywood. And she's gonna give a little bit of a deeper dive into food justice in Boston, specifically through her office's vantage point. And again, She's very new, so I'm excited that we're one of her first <laughs> public conversations. So um, just excited to see um, what you've learned through your um, through your time with the office. And you know, feel free to share about what's going on with you and your team. Well, thank you so much, Anne. I really appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to be here with uh, all the folks on the call. Um, as hinted, I am the newest employee of the Office of Food Justice, and I would not be surprised if there are members of the call here that have more historical context on what partnerships have already existed with the Office of Food Justice. And so um, feel free to catch me on anything, be like, oh yeah, no, you do that well. Or like, oh no, this is an area for improvement. Like that's, that's why I wanna be here. That's why I wanna be able to be part of this community conversation. Um, we can go to the next slide. Uh, so what I'll review a little bit today is just some of the background about the office, uh, the programs that we currently coordinate and uh, collaborate with, and then obviously we'll transition into question time from there and have discussions with the rest of the amazing panelists that we have here today. So we can go to the next slide from there. Yeah. Um, so some of the background, you can keep going. As far as the mission of the Office of Food Justice, I feel like it kind of encapsulates the different pieces that Ayana led to uh, or led off with in the beginning of the presentation. Uh, 
the mission as our office defines it is uh, to build a food system that is equitable, just, resilient, and sustainable. And in pursuit of this mission, the Office of Food Justice will work to expand equitable access to nutritious food with respect to affordability, physical accessibility, and cultural connectedness. Uh, and part of that means supporting Boston's food ecosystem and promote environmentally sustainable and resilient food production. So it's not just the food that you, it's not just food insecurity, it's not just your relationship with food, it's the, the wider system and how we got to this place. All right, we can skip ahead to the next slide. And so our office is nested within the, um, the cabinet of the Environment, Energy and Open Space. And we look at the mayor's food justice agenda to really drive the, the different programs that, that we choose to pursue in the office. We also work in alignment with Grow Boston, which is essentially the city's urban ag department that we collaborate with. Uh, we also work with the Boston Food Access Council and really are taking a larger food systems approach to tackle policy changes that will help influence making improvements to the system. You can go to the next slide. Can continue from there. I'll review briefly just some of the programs that we collaborate with. Uh, this kind of touches briefly on some of the funding that we get and how we are transferring this ARPA funding into actual uh, projects, which include creating raised beds throughout the city so that way people have access to grow their own food should they choose to, uh, making sure that the food that's available at farmers markets is affordable for those who choose to eat it. Um, and that can be through the HIP program. Uh, we also work with trying to make sure that the food that's distributed in Boston public schools is culturally relevant. So that way it reflects the communities that uh, the school district is trying to serve. Can continue from there. One of the programs that we, uh, that we help coordinate is the Farmer's Market Coupon Program. And so last summer, there were 23 participating markets. Actually, I think it might've been 22. And uh, we worked with different community-based organizations to distribute coupons. So that way folks had access to essentially additional funds in order to spend, uh, stretch their spending dollars at farmer's markets. This is in addition to any sort of hip incentive uh, funds that they have on their EBT card. And we are working to um, uh, maintain this program and if anything expand it and find out which farmers markets might be able to um, uh, extend the coupon program to make sure that every community that has the privilege of having a farmers market is able to stretch that money. You can go on to the next one. We also collaborate with Boston Public Schools with their summer feeding program because we know that Students who rely on free meals in the summer are no long, it's not like hunger goes away once the school year ends. And so we really try to work with them to make sure that there are meals available for school age students during the summer months and that it is easy for families and students to find those locations. We can go on to the next one. Some benefit programs that we really try to um, elevate and, uh, and coordinate with is the Double Up Food Bucks program. So those who have SNAP get uh, up to 50% off your fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, we are trying to port partner with different stores that are in uh, neighborhoods throughout the city that historically have not had strong grocery store presence. And so this is a way to try to encourage stores to carry fresh produce in there and be able to track um, that we are making funds available to uh, residents in those areas and that that actually gets to benefit those who shop at those stores. There's also the HIP Farmers Markets Program, which I brought up previously is where you can save when you shop with your EBT card at participating HIP farm vendors. So we really try to get the word out about which farmers markets and which farm vendors uh, accept HIP funding and we'll be able to stretch those dollars for the healthy foods that are grown locally. And uh, hot off the press, we're really trying to, we will be getting the word out about Summer EBT, which is a program that offers money to families instead of if going to a site and you're having your child participate in an enrichment program in order to receive a meal and stay at that site to, to consume that food. There is a Summer EBT program where if you have SNAP benefits, 
you get additional funds put onto that account. So that way, that again, will help stretch dollars to actually purchase food for your children outside of the, the school months. We can continue from there. And just to kind of give you the longer range vision for what the Office of Food Justice pursues, uh, you can see here that not only we, are we thinking about food access and what the issues are now and how to get food to folks who need it, but we're also looking at how do we shape our policies so that way we prevent hunger from being so prevalent in the first place. Part of that is trying to lead with example through our procurement practices. Um, and that includes the Good Food Purchasing Program with BPS. We're also trying to hold our other city counterparts accountable, uh, other institutions within the city uh, to make sure that they that those serving food in secure communities also are held to high standards. We want to increase food recovery or, or redistrib redistribution of surplus foods to make sure that we don't have a food system that both has members of our community that are food insecure and also a system that has so much food waste. Uh, and so we are trying to partner with Grow Boston to support neighborhood level growing. So that way people have a, a certain sense of food independence, being able to grow their own food should they choose to do so. And just making sure that we are not supporting um, two different systems of food access, trying to build an equitable food access and distribution systems that uh, make sure that it centers the voice of the community and those who are most impacted by food insecurity. And so I touched on this earlier, we can go to the next slide on that. The Good Food Purchasing Program is one of those longer range plans that over the, the course of years will have a, a strong impact on the city and our regional food system. Essentially, it, it states that we are using, if the city is using funds, if the Boston Public Schools is using taxpayer dollars to buy food for Boston Public School students, we want to make sure that we're not just buying the cheapest food. We want to make sure that um, there are four different aspects that are taken into consideration when we work with partners and where we are purchasing food. We want to make sure that the product itself is nutritious, that it is free from um, products that may be problematic uh, to put into the diet of our youth. We want to make sure that we're partnering with folks who have environmental sustainability as a cornerstone of their operations. We want to make sure that they have um, uh, that they provide safe and healthy working conditions for the different manufacturers that are providing the foods towards BPS. We want to make sure that we are not supporting an industry that um, doesn't include a livable wage for those who work within the food system. And we want to make sure that it is uh, uh, keeps into consideration animal welfare and the health of our planet. So that's a way where we're using our tax dollars and saying, this is a priority for Boston. If you wanna do business with us, these are, have to be your priorities as well. And by getting other anchor institutions to agree to these terms and spreading that out, it's going to change the food system in the long run. We can go to the next slide. And I think, I think that wraps it up. Again, there may be some of you who are on this call like, oh, Melissa, I could give a whole dissertation on that. And so I'm looking forward to all the questions that, that you guys have and um, also hearing from the rest of our panel. Thank you guys so much. Awesome. Thank you so much for giving us a quick um, overview of what food justice looks like in, um, in Boston. And thank you so much for your office's work. And I know um, we'll we'll get into a deeper dive into what these partnerships look like to make sure that we're um, you know, creating access to healthy foods. I will say as a quick shout out, everyone that's on this panel one way or the other has worked really closely with Vital Connections through our food work um, initiatives. So I know for our, our NFAC people, I see quite a few on this call. Thank you so much for joining us um, because you really make um, the world in our neighborhoods um, a healthier place by making sure that these food distributions are happening, that folks have access to the information that they need in order to find these healthy foods. So um, I will put in the chat if, if you do want to learn more about the Neighborhood Food Access Collaborative, um, short for short is MFAC. Um, 
I will definitely put that in um, our chat, but it's vitalconnections.org slash NFAC, N-F-A-C. And I believe just by looking, all of our panelists one way or the other are involved with this work. So I'm really happy to see how through this conversation we can share all of our part in making sure that we have access to healthy foods. And I do know as we transition into the conversation, um, I do see some stuff in the chat that I wanna make sure that we get to. And I'll make sure that um, we also give time for folks that if you do want to be a part of the conversation and something moves you, feel free to either put it in the chat or raise your hand. Uh, we will have a more formal time towards the end just for, for you all to ask questions of the panelists. But um, we just wanna make sure that we, we set the ground rules uh, for the conversation so everyone can feel included. So without further ado, I'm going to bring up our panelists to the virtual stage. So give me one moment. So first I'm going to bring up Melissa Honeywood. She's already given us a really great um, overview of what food justice looks like in Boston. Of course, again, she is the new deputy director of the mayor's office of food justice. So thank you so much for joining us. All right, and then next we have Angela Brown, who's a nutritionist and the president of the Boston Organization of Nutritionists and Dietitians of Color, which is also known as BOND. And I heard somebody has a new title. Is that true, Angela? Okay, so from what I hear, she is the new WIC program director. So I just wanna shout you out here amongst um, community members and say congratulations and thank you so much for your work. All right. So then next I'm bringing up someone that I know I've had the joy of sharing space with, um, our good friend, Rick Henry uh, from Health Leads, um, but he's also uh, a part of MFACT, a community um, leader there. And he's done a lot of great work for teaching me about, um, you know, getting in touch with community, telling me about the food distributions he does. So I'm really excited to have Rick and his plants here for um, this evening's conversation. So hi, Rick. Thanks for joining us. All right. And then last but not least, we do have, I'm just looking for a second pinner. All right, Elisa. Hey, Lisa. Here, where you are. Okay. Okay, Elisa Manander is the Senior Director of Food Insecurity at the, um, at the Boston YMCA. I really love working with your um with your organization because I know with there being so many whys throughout Greater Boston, it's a place where community members come together, you know, find healthy options to move in their communities and to have programs in order to connect to what's out there and what's to their avail. So I know that the work that you do is really important. So thank you so much for joining us um, and being a part of the conversation. And I can't wait to learn more about what you do as well. All right. So we have our panelists here and we had a bit of um, some ground setting when it comes to food justice in Boston. So I would love to open it up um, for everyone here, um, just with a simple question. Um, for you and your work, what is something that inspires you to, um, to work in the food justice space? I think we all have our own stories when it comes to our relationships with food, you know, access to those healthy foods, um, and what that and what that looks like for either ourselves, our family, or for our community. But I would love to kind of just open it up um, and start there for um, what inspired you to get um, into into this kind of work. Um, and I will hand it over to Angela uh, to start. Good evening, everyone. Ayana, thank you for that lovely introduction. I am super excited to be in the room. 
Um, so yeah, I guess what inspired me to be the nutritionist that I am in the community today is um, understanding that even, what, 20 years ago, a lot of people of color were facing health disparities. So initially, I went to go to school for pharmacy. And I was like, well, you know, that's not quite the fix, you know, and I got really passionate about having a preventative method, a uh, preventative way to, you know, go about handling food disparities in um and more so health disparities that that are food related. Um, so yeah, I'm super passionate still to the, still to this day, and looking to make the change ever the more because the people most affected with these health disparities is usually, you know, people of color and could somewhat be avoided. So I'm hopeful, you know, that as we continue on our path, that eventually, you know, some of these issues can now be rectified. Thank you. Um, anyone else, you're free to to jump in. I want to make this as conversational as possible. So, you know, I don't, you know, I don't want to call on folks. So just feel free. This is we're amongst friends. You know, we all kind of talk about <laughs> the stuff we do. So, you know, let's shake it off a bit, you know, have a little fun. But Rick, I saw you on mute. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure, real pleasure to be here. I like being in um instances like this where, you know, people are talking about food security, you know, not only am I here to share, to share what I know, but I'm also here to learn a lot about what you guys are doing and how I could do my job better. Um, I wanted to say uh, to Melissa, uh, congratulations. I met you a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Angela, a big congratulations to you too. And Alicia, um, Alicia, it's always great to see you. Um, what inspired me, I think in 2020 during COVID, um, you know, I used to do some driving around to take my son different places. And uh, I think uh, one time we, you know, I took him to my McDonald's, don't judge me. And um, just to get a little something for himself, kind of the inspiration, he's working at home, school and everything. So, um, and, and I, I kept seeing all these long lines of people, you know, waiting at pantries for food and everything. And, always wondered like what what you know what what's happening i know it's COVID and everything and you know people weren't able to get food as they would like and um one time i stopped by a place uh on what was a river street um right next to a clinic and they had some hot food i just come from mcdonald's and they had hot food like chicken and rice and stuff i was like damn if i had known i would stop here first so anyway i got some for myself and ran into uh uh, this woman named um, Angela from Jen, I'm sorry, from Health Leads, and we started to have a conversation, and um, you know, it it was really encouraging, really, really encouraging when I when I heard what you know she was planning and what was on her mind, and um, so I was really inspired then, and, and we stayed in touch, and we got to do you know some of this great work that we're doing today, and um, now a minute. Um, I feel like I can't stop. Yeah, you know, I, I organized before for many years on uh, different um, different issues, and um, it was one of those cases where every time we we felt like we took a step forward, we were taking actually uh, two back. So, in food security world, I, food insecurity, food security. I feel like there's um, together, like collectively, uh, with the community and with all these great people that are doing this work, um, some a lot longer than I have. I, it, you know, it always feels like we, we're moving forward, like we can get something done together. You know, we sit down and put our heads together. We always uh, make things happen. So that inspired me. And I think I've landed exactly where I, where I need to be. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. I can go next. Um, good to see everybody. And thank you so much for having me on the panel. Um, I think this question is really important. I always feel like it's important to center on like the why we do what we do. And so my my why would actually, I think, stem from where I was born and how I was raised. So I was actually born in Nepal and immigrated here when I was young. And my family 
uh, our business was to grow and sell rice. So we had like a rice field and a rice plantation. And um, that's how, you know, I grew up and um, all of the like traditions and celebrations and holidays in my Nepali culture centers around food. And it comes with people just in the kitchen, um, all hands in making dumplings together, making, you know, molding the, the meat together with our hands. And so um, that was, you know, a very important part of my story and who who I am and who I was growing up. And um, it, it wasn't until I moved to this country that I realized that's not how everybody um, centers their life. Um, and not because they don't want to, but maybe because they can't um, and they don't have the resources to be able to do that. And so when, you know, I was uh, in undergrad, I, I realized that there was a a uh, degree that existed um, around dietetics where I could really work with food. And so I was really interested in that, but it didn't, for me at that time, it didn't answer the question of, well, what happens if someone who is, you know, diagnosed as having diabetes can't, um, doesn't even have the access point to buy quote unquote healthy food. And so that was really like my why of why I wanted to go into this work around food justice and food insecurity is because um, I felt, you know, and I still feel obviously that there are so many barriers that exist and challenges that exist for people in order to get the food that they want and the and the food that they need. And um, so I think that's really what inspires me to keep doing the work that I do, um, because I feel like it is really important for all of us to be able to find joy in our food and um, and it to be a source of not only nourishment um, nutritionally, but nourishment, I think, like in our soul. So that's why I do the work that I do. I heard so much of what each other panelist said in their story that kind of echoed different aspects of my own. So I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised, but it's always encouraging to hear. Um, I feel like my, my why, my origin story is uh, similarly, I feel like when uh, Lisa, uh, Lisa, you said that like, oh yeah, in my culture, like it's all centered around food. And I feel like growing up, as I'm sure many folks on the call that may have resonated with you as far as just being in the kitchen, being around family, making food. And I, I have um, some Italian heritage where we we're just a very food heavy family. And so it was one of my chores when in my young uh, family of four with a single parent household, my chore was I made the lunch for all all the kids before we went to school. And so that was just kind of my, my gig once I was old enough to take it. And so that kind of got me affiliated with food. And then I ended up going to culinary school uh, to be a pastry chef and then had a crisis of conscience and realized oh, I may not be helping a ton of people by just making cakes and cookies. I make a lot of friends, but not, not, not necessarily helping people. Um, and so I switched over to dietetics. And similarly to what Angela said, as far as like in the, usually in the pursuit of a dietetics degree or a didactic um, internship program, it's very much centered on uh, clinical dietetics, working in a hospital. But to me, that felt very reactive. So reactive nutrition counseling as instead of proactive nutrition intervention. And so I found my way into school nutrition. I was actually the chef and dietitian for Baltimore City Public Schools down in Maryland with 84,000 students, 204 schools. And then 12 years ago, I started as the director of food nutrition services for Cambridge Public Schools just across the river. So I've been doing a lot of work with trying to make the school meals better and more accessible. And it was actually during the pandemic when March 13th, school shut down. March 16th, 30, 30 staff members and myself were serving meals outside of schools to any family who wanted it. Like just seeing like, oh no, hunger doesn't stop just because the school day ends. And just figuring out how do we serve the members of the community and just being there on the ground and seeing just how fragile our food system is um, was a real wake-up call and kind of drew me into more food systems work. And what I feel hopeful about um, is that one, an office of food justice exists in the city of Boston. Two, that there are so many strong, engaged partners that are working with the office of food justice and 
three part of the, I mean, this conversation, I feel like what Richard said, as far as having people connect the dots, there's, there's so much good stuff happening that trying to make those connections to move it all forward in the same direction. So we're not going one step forward, two steps back, just having this cross pollination of, of information is what makes me hopeful. Wow, thank you, everybody. Um, I always feel like starting with your why is so important um, because we all bring something to the table. Um, so thank you, thank you so much for sharing. Um, so I know each of you touched on this one way or the other when it comes to your work and, and what food justice looks like in Boston. Um, you know, from your vantage point and with your expertise, um, where do you see the gaps in the food ecosystem right now? I guess I can start. Mm -hmm. um, so when you say gaps, I feel like Boston is a world of resources, right? So we have so many different programs, um, supplemental, you know, nutritional programs, uh, that that is circulating in Boston and people have access to, but there's a disconnect, right? So there's something to say when people say that they are still considered food insecure. So they they have HIP, they have SNAP, they have WIC, they have all these different resources, even farmers market. But why aren't they accessing it, right? Like what what's happening with the healthy healthy foods and and being able to eat those healthy foods? Because I I can teach day in and day out you know, eat healthier, you know, we're all trying to eat healthy and nutritious foods are important. But at the end of the day, if people say, well, you know, it is important, but why do people feel like fruits and veggies or healthy foods are too expensive? First and foremost, like the whys are very important to um kind of dive into. So the gaps I feel are the disconnect between what we're expecting people to now have and eat and access and what they actually have and are able to access. So just driving through Boston, I was trying, you know, kind of gave my kids a couple of like a, a 101, nutrition 101 in, in different communities and just pointing out all the different restaurants as you drive down Blue Hill Ave, say for instance, why are there so many restaurants and how many of them are actually serving fruits and veggies? So to me, it's almost like a systematic placement of where all these things are happening in these different communities that are kind of keeping people, I would even just say Americans with access, like majority of people have access, but what kind of access do they have? Are they more helpful food or not so much? And then at the end of the day, can can you can you can you blame people for having these access and not succumbing to the temptation of it? Like, yeah, if you have a I don't know, I'm not going to say any names, but any kind of fast foods at every corner, how many times can you walk by it before you're like, oh, I want a hamburger or I want those French fries or whatever the case may be, you know? So I think the gaps are uh, systemic areas and in, in, in placements of different, you know, restaurants and um, having access to the right, the right kind of foods. Yes, amen to that. And I, I go by the temptation all the time. I'm trying hard. So <laughs> echoing that, um, Rick, I, I saw that you came off you, go ahead. Yeah, I have to agree with Angela um, about that. And um, also I wanted to mention that I remember last year, what we did was um, we had some SNAP advocates. It was interesting to find out that there were so many people who um, who knew about these programs, but automatically didn't think they qualified to be on these programs. We were able to sign up a, a lot of people, an astronomical amount of people, and it, I was kind of surprised at that. You know, I thought that a um, typical person out there kind of knew what these programs were, and, you know, knew what if they were, you know, able to 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 use these programs to get good food, uh, fruit and vegetables. And so not even the uh, farmer's market as well, you know. Um, talking about the farmer's market, I gotta say thank you to all of you, uh, Office of Food Justice, everybody for making those uh, vouchers available at the farmer's market. But I, I think that access is the uh, is key right here. There's uh, a lot of people, and then there's uh, there are also a lot of folks out there who are undocumented, who don't even, you know, try and, you know, as long as you're in this country, we feel like everybody needs to be. So, 
access and resources and stuff like that are extremely important and critical. Like we need to get the word out that people know, you know, even if you think that um, you, you're not going to get it, you, you still got to try, you know, because uh, it's, it's available for, for everyone. That's my piece. Yeah, I think going off of Rick's point about access, I would agree. I think, um, you know, access is such an all encompassing word, you know, and um, I really think about even just like physical access to grocery stores. So what Angela is talking about how to even get the fresh fruits and vegetables. If you look at the different neighborhoods in Boston, each of them vary so widely in terms of what physical stores exist in each neighborhood. And one, there could be uh, Trader Joe's, a stop and shop in a Whole Foods, and in another, there's, uh, you know, only stop and shop. And so I think um, one of the biggest gaps in Boston that exist around the access point is just uh, the physical stores that do or don't exist in each of the different neighborhoods, and then also the discrepancies behind those stores as well. Um, I read a report, I believe it was published last year that, um, you know, they went to the same store like Stop and Shop in different neighborhoods and then the prices of the products were all different depending on the neighborhood. And so you talk about like access, but then you talk about also the economics behind it. Um, why are you charging more in one neighborhood um, for the same produce or the same, you know, product than you would in a different neighborhood. And I think that really, like, it's just, I, I, you know, it speaks to like the barriers that exist for people, not only talking about the physical access, but like barriers to even sign up for these food assistance programs. It could be barriers within the system itself of like, you need to find the right person to find, fill the right form and check the right box. But also it could be a barrier instilled uh, culturally as well, which is not a fault to anyone of around stigma. So what Rick talked about, you know, folks who are undocumented may not even want to apply for certain resources or folks who are from the immigrant communities may not want to pursue looking at certain resources because of the stigma that exists. Um, and again, it's not their fault at all. It's there for a reason. But I, I think those are really the biggest gaps that I would kind of point out in the ecosystem that exists here. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree that uh, each of the other panelists touched on the major access gap. Although if you wanna get into deep philosophical discussions as far as like looking at the different layers of the onion, it's, I mean, I have the mindset that it's not so much that the food system is broken, it's working exactly as it was designed to do. Um, and so I feel like the gaps are, are in who is at the table to help shape policy, who isn't at the table to help try to steer us in a new direction. And I feel like part of that is making sure that we have enough community voice and make amplifying that voice to those who are in position of powers to change how maybe they do business, to change how um, we make it easier to do um, business that supports the values of the city of Boston and the citizens of the city of Boston. So. I'll just I'll add that layer on top of it. That's a good that's a good way to put it, Melissa. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, with thinking about all of these things that riddle the food ecosystem here in Boston, um, I think all the pieces that you name are really important, right? Um, whether it be depending on the neighborhood you live in, that determines a lot when it comes to your health. And we all we all have seen different reports about how that can how your life expectancy can change by the decade, depending on where you live. And, um, you know, looking outside your window um, and looking around your blocks, it definitely depends on, you know, the healthy foods that are available, whether they be um, from a grocery store, right? And which grocery store is that? Um, or we even have these opportunities that I know um, were brought up by Melissa, like the... Um, you know, like the pop-ups that happen throughout the summer and the warm months when people can go to the local farmer's market and get healthy, fresh produce right in their community. So um, I think for me, um, as someone who's, you know, in the advocacy, advocacy space that talks to a number of people that are um, creating solutions, I think the main gap is, you know, streamlining those efforts. And, you know, making sure information sharing is really easy. Um, I know um, we've 
you know, you know, us here at Vital Connections, we've worked with pieces of that ecosystem to try to make it work. But of course, you know, things are ever changing, right? Um, and especially now, post pandemic, everyone is trying to, you know, take a look at, you know, where we are now and where we can go. So with looking at, you know, looking to the future and being optimistic, um, what are some, you know, you know, what are some things that are happening in Boston and beyond that um, really are lending to great solution making? Because I think a lot of times we can name the issues and the problems, but I know, I know each of you individually do great things, right? Um, but I would love to just give an opportunity for you all to kind of share something that we may not know that's working really well. Um, and how can we support you? Because I think that's really important with um, build the capacity and movement building to make sure that we have a greater ecosystem for access. I mean, I will shout out my um, my colleague, Nizreen, who's on the call. Um, one thing that uh, we're excited to be pursuing is the Community Outreach Leaders Grant, where we, the Office of Food Justice put it out there to try to get members of the community to essentially work on this communication piece to make sure that information is being disseminated um, from your neighbors. So that way it's not coming from a disembodied government agency, it's coming person to person from, from peers, people that you live with that you know. So that way it can actually get to the people who need it and have that type of um, targeted approach. And so we put out a grant to try to get uh, um, different community-based organizations to apply. It's closing this week. Um, this we put in a lot of work and we're really excited to um, do the next phase once that's closed up to see well, which applicants will be successful and being able to reach out to the, the community and get their feedback from there. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 you go, Angela. <laughs> <laughs> I was just saying that I think for a, a number of years, we've been looking and searching for um, some support at a higher level. And I think finally, somebody's talking and somebody's getting the message because Vilsack has now come out with the pillars, right? And now that's another like a governmental type of support and backing to now the smaller, more local level type um, community engagement programs like Vaughn to kind of be spearheaded, right? And to get out there in the community and do the work, but now recognizing that it's a, a massive problem, right? More so than just at the community level. So having policies in place and those type of things really, really does help for one, given the severity of the situation, like helping people to recognize how serious this really is. And for two, it backs the local level because now they're saying, oh, somebody's recognizing that this is a big issue. Maybe we're now kind of getting on board, but just to have that support is like phenomenal. And I don't believe we've had that support in years prior. And the same with, you know, healthcare systems and now having, you know, access to uh, dietitians and stuff through the insurance, that, that, those things really do matter. That kind of shows like we're all moving progressively towards the future, not so much two steps backwards, but now I'm, we're putting one foot in front of the other. We're kind of making those small um, changes that become big systematic changes. And I know Bon, um, we do a lot of like cooking classes and just different things to help people recognize where their resources are on the local level, but it overall helps them in their mind understand that it is available and they do have access and they can create healthy, you know, meals and, and have uh, healthy habits that they can now pass down the generation to generation to generation. And this is why I get super excited and passionate about teaching nutrition. Cause you know, I grew up in the same type of environments as the people that I'm teaching. Right. I, I, I grew up at the table where, you know, mom is making me eat everything on my plate or we didn't eat the most helpful foods. We didn't always have the most, you know, nutritious foods in the house and she may do, but you know, we can change our mindset. And I think as we're moving forward collectively as a people, um, I, I can only see hope and um, I'm inspired to continue to do the things that I do. Yeah, I think for me, um, something that like I would really like to highlight is the collaboration that just exists in the like food resources community here in Boston across 
different organizations. You know, like we at the YMC have worked so closely with Rick for a really long time. And um, I think to be able to provide that support for one another and the resources to one another is really important because it means we're not acting in our silos. We're, sorry, my cat is here. Um, we're working, you know, together. And um, just another thing is, you know, for, I'll just, Rick, I'll use you as an example, right? At Health Leads, we provide weekly um, grocery bags to his organization, but also we've expanded on that partnership to do um, nutrition education centered around SNAP education as well. So I think the thing that I'm looking forward to is um, resources that are kind of building off of each other. And um, Melissa, like the community uh, leaders, outreach leaders grant from OFJ is so important because um, folks who could apply for SNAP also probably are utilizing all of these other resources as well. So how do we create that connection and that collaboration? And that's something that I'm really looking forward to because I feel like we in Boston are have been doing that and then are more um, outwardly like moving in that direction as well. I appreciate you for mentioning that, Alicia. Um, that's awesome. And I'm looking forward to seeing you guys this spring as well. Um, come back. I've, I've been talking to um, some of your colleagues about um, nutrition and um, helping folks to have the uh, right conversations uh, with your doctors, like repeat period when they walk into the office to make sure, like Angela said, that, um, you know, that, uh, if you have health insurance, you, uh, you, you have access to a, a nutritionist. A lot of people don't know that. It's hard to ever get mentions when you go to the doctor. Um, I think uh, one of the main things I wanted to highlight, as everybody knows, is a is community so you know just living in a different disenfranchised community um having the community um be able to take part in what happens in that community you know like access and you know just coming together and, and putting their heads together and trying to determine what they would like to see happen in the community and actually having the opportunity to go after that to try to make that happen i think that that's um that's crucial and because that's extremely important it works well you know um, I think that people will have a right um, to have the opportunity to make those decisions as to what happens in their community, how it's done, um, look out for each other. You yeah. know, I was raised in a place where we kind of, you know, it's, everybody was kind of their brother's keeper. It takes a village, right? right. So um, I don't see why we can't, you know, do that here. I mean, some of us have no other choice. Anyway. So um, that's one of the things that I really wanted to have. Like, it's been working well. And, um, you know, we're going to continue doing that um, until we can't. Well said, well said. And at least if, you're, if your cat has anything to say, um, more than happy to let them speak to, you know, cats need to eat as well. <laughs> She'll just be showing off her butt to everybody. So I don't think we need that. <laughs> oh, gosh. But um, I do see um, Belinda, I've seen you've been active in the chat and I see your hands up. So feel free to come off mute if you want or put it in the chat, um, whatever you'd like to ask. Because we want to make sure that we have everyone involved in the conversation. Okay, it is in the chat. So I'll go ahead and read. Um, Belinda would like to know what's the difference between a dietitian and a nutritionist? And how can I use food combinations to reduce bloating, improve my um, satiety and weight loss? my safety and weight loss. Um, I can offer a little bit of context for that. Sorry, my, my wife just handed me my dinner. So this is very timely. Um, yeah. So the difference between a dietitian and a nutritionist is that in order to be called a registered dietitian, you need to go through um, a bachelor's program uh, a didactically approved internship program, um, and then you need to take an exam and keep up with continuing education credits. Um, the term nutritionist isn't licensed, it's not tied to anything. However, a lot of dietitians use the term nutritionist interchangeably. So you could, somebody who has a TikTok that takes pictures of their breakfast could call themselves a nutritionist and like that's not, like nobody can counter that. But in order to call yourself a dietitian, that is showing that you have formal training that's backed up behind it. That's not to say that there are folks that don't have formal training that don't also have intrinsic nutrition knowledge. I feel like that there are probably elders in, in your community that 
know what a good meal should be and know what healthy food should be. Um, but they don't necessarily have to be a registered dietitian in order to do that. I feel like um, the dietitian process is scientifically backed through Western medicine. And so that in and of itself has its own lens. Um, and so that has benefits as far as being able to look at scientific studies and what that's proving. But um, even in my time as a dietitian, that science is continually evolving because um, what we put in our bodies is very complex. And so um, I, I, that is the difference between a dietitian and a nutritionist as far as what the licensing procedure is, but I don't want to um, discount what um, intrinsic knowledge some folks may have about their, their um, about what health could look like. I don't know, Angela, if you have more to add on that. I appreciate that, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Honeywood. I just had I just had Angela. Um, before you before you start, I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut cut in. Wrong. I just I just had so I was told that you know um lemon like adding lemon to your water could help cut down and reduce swelling of like lemon cucumber combination. Um, so that's what I was trying to get to, like what combinations food combinations that are like easy. Uh, to prepare that I could kind of like use in like in a daily, in a daily, on a daily basis that would, and then I asked earlier about how do I, I actually want to cut off like rice um, because I feel like eating food out has caused me to eat a lot more rice than what I usually have and has contributed to my weight gain. So I want to like, just, you know, try to figure out how I could portion it out or you know, should it be like three times a week or, you know, I, I just need to know a little bit more um, because I've seen dietitians and dietitians just tell me to get gastric bypass, so. Well, thank you for sharing, Belinda. I tell you, you're not the only one, that's for sure. We deal with um, a lot of the community members day in and day out with the same issues. And I think to address it, you first have to know where the bloating is coming from because some people might be bloating because of, I don't know, like different reasons. Um, sodium intake can increase the water gain in your body. So, you know, things like that, you have to seek out your your physician first um, and then kind of try to fill out the things that might work for you. Because like Melissa said, nutrition is complex and everybody's body is different. Uh, I do know that I teach balance and I teach um, making sure everything is in moderation. And when you start restricting yourself from different food groups, then you start to um, play the doctor or the, or the scientist, if you will. If you're doing like a chemical experiment and you start taking one and pouring one and then leaving one out, you don't know what the composition will now make up and, and, and fend for itself, if you will. So your body is really good at disseminating information and knowing what to do and how to get that type of information back into the body through nu nutrients like minerals and all your different foods work together is what I'm trying to say. Um, so instead of in, in avoiding carbs altogether through rice, you can try more things like whole grain, quinoa or brown rice and things like that. Um, teff, even some of the uh, more historic type greens. And this is what we teach in, in bonds. So I, I would really welcome you to come join our class. We have them virtually. We also have them, um, in person, um, uh, and, you know, see how we can kind of explore these new concepts together. Cause not, you're not alone. Thank you, oh, Ms. Angela. Did you take Go ahead. I'm sorry. I just want to add too that I am a nutritionist. And like Melissa said, there's so many people on uh, social media now who call themselves nutritionists, but you have to really look at the reputable sources there. Like, did they just get a certificate, you know, six months going on to school online somewhere and they're now considered a certified nutritionist? Or did they do the longevity didactic program that Melissa was talking about? I'm a nutritionist and I've been teaching nutrition since... I don't know, I'm going to date myself now, 2005. <laughs> and what makes me different from a dietitian is that I didn't complete the, the like, it's like 15 months internship didactic program through the didactic program accredited by a college. And so at the end of the day, I, I am still licensed nutritionist, um, but I am not a registered dietitian because I didn't take the exam. So yeah, that's the differences as well. You had a question? I'm sorry. Uh, yes. 
Thank you. I apologize. Um, so just the last thing where I, I know other people have questions too. So just the last thing, um, where can I like sign up to get help from you guys? Ooh. Like you said that you, you meet and then the other thing you said, I remember somebody said something about raised beds and like trying to make your own food and um, taking the class and how to use them. I just put a, our email okay. on the color. In thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, and as far as the raised bed program, I'll be, I'll keep it 100. I don't really know uh, exactly what the process is for that. Um, it's a partnership with, between um, Grow Boston and the Office of Food Justice. So um, I can make sure it's, it's likely on our website and I'll try to find it throughout the rest of the panel and I'll put it in the chat. Um, but I do wanna say, Belinda, like you're already on the path, you are listening to your body. So as Richard said, like next time you see your physician, like if you leave space for your physician to dictate what the, the appointment will be, they will take that time. So if you walk in saying like, hey, I've noticed with my body that I feel best when I eat blah, 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 or I've noticed that um, I feel worse when X, Y, Z. So if you come with information, either by taking a food journal or something like that, just so that way you're tracking how you feel when you concern, consume certain things, that's going to arm you with more information. Uh, well, one, just having you listen to your body, because I feel like our society just makes it very easy to be distracted um, by people um, taking pictures of their breakfast on TikTok. Um, and so like if you're then paying attention to what you're actually eating and how that's making you feel, that is information that you're armed with. And then if you have it in a format, whether they're, I mean, there are apps that exist, whether it's on a notebook, whatever, if you're bringing that information to your physician and saying, this is what I've noticed and I'd like to um, what do you think? What what can next exploratory steps be from there? That can help guide you. And if it's something that they don't know about, you can always ask, could I see a registered dietitian? Or could I could I have outpatient counseling with a nutritionist? Those are those are good next steps if if that's something. But you're already there. It sounds like you're already paying attention. So kudos to you for that. Thank you. Did you say outpatient um appointment? Does that mean yeah. that's something that different? Like, that means like counseling. They may say like, oh, we'll, um, they may not, if in case they don't have one in your network, it may be like a referral. Oh, okay. Because I, I'm just, I've had it, honestly, with dietitians telling me to have gastric bypass. I'm just, I'm done with that. So um, I'm just trying to figure it out, you know, and um, I don't feel like, everybody's different you know what I mean so to each his own but I, f I feel like for me um that, that's not the right thing for me and I want people that are actually going to listen so mm -hmm. so thank you again for your help and your time and um, I'm going to continue to listen on thank you thank you for answering my questions thank you and Belinda thank you for sharing I know it takes a lot um of bravery to like share like your personal like journey in a space of people. So, you know, one, this is the right place to do it. We've got a number of ex experts. I also took down um, Angela's email because <laughs> I've been wanting to learn more about um, what Bond does. I also know they have a really great cookbook um, that I've been flipping through when it comes to some of the healthy recipes. And we have a number of resources that we'll be emailing out to everyone after the um after the conversation tonight. So feel free um, to take a look at those and stay connected with us because we always love um, to share different things that are going on in the community here. So, you know, thank you so much for um, sharing that with us. I dropped the link to the cookbook in the chat. Thank you. Thank you so much. I Good. tried to get screenshot. Good. Thank you. <laughs> I might be one of those TikTokers who are putting what I made, you know, do a little, do a little PR for you, you know? Let's so go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You but, should post uh, it. Post it and then uh you know link up with Bond of Color on, okay. on Facebook as well. <laughs> okay. Well, well all right. I think we've got another program, part two coming up soon. But um I think that that also brings me into a space that I, I wanted to touch on when it comes to food justice. Um uh, from that first slide that I showed, we talked about um some of like the the pillars that are a part of um the conversation. 
when it comes to food justice. But I think folks' relationship with food is really important when we're talking about this, right? Um, whether you have access to it or not, whether you feel like it's, you know, getting the healthy things that you need are too, you know, out of scope or mm, I don't like the way that that tastes is bland. I know I'm used to, you know, you know, my grandmother, my auntie giving me like, you know, fried fish on, on Sunday evenings and I'm used to that, but that may not be the healthiest thing, right? So can you all kind of share a bit about um, how folks should look at their relationship with food, whether that's the access or the cultural piece? Because I also understand what solution making um, and bringing access to healthy foods is also about bringing those culturally relevant relevant foods, right? To make sure that they're mindful of, you know, religious needs, um, other dietary needs, or, you know, just understanding our global community here in Boston, that folks are getting things that they can recognize and know, um, you know, how to best prepare and consume for their families. So I think the relationship is really important. I definitely wanted to kind of pose that to you all because we started to touch on that. But how do you feel about how folks should approach not just individuals, but individuals and other folks in the ecosystem, how we should look at the relationship with food, whether we personal or cultural. I mean, I can um, start a little bit by saying as far as how to approach food from a cultural perspective, as far as, and tying into food access, um, I'd say advocacy is a key piece of that. If there are environments where you feel like your culture is not being um, uh, acknowledged or represented, it is okay. And you, you should feel encouraged to have your voice be heard. Um, an example of uh, advocacy in action is that um, this year, Boston Public Schools actually is having uh, kosher and halal meals available for students. And um, that was in part due to advocacy um, from folks that want to be able to do that. And they actually, um, during the month of Ramadan, which um, for those who are celebrating, I apologize, I had my dinner on the screen earlier. Um, what they're doing is they actually applied for a waiver from the state in order to let students who celebrate Ramadan to take meals home because they made these beautiful halal meals just for these students and didn't want them to just stay at school when they aren't able to consume them. But the way that that happened is they advocated to BPS who then advocated to the state who then made these changes possible. And so it takes being able to, to say like, yeah, my, I, my culture is valid and I want, how can we recognize it? How can we fold each other in? I can add something. Um, culture is a really big thing. And culture, not just by race, but as a human race, we all have a culture, if you will. And so understanding what your food culture growing up uh, was and why you think the way you think about food now as an adult, um, it's a really great perspective to have. And it's a really good hat of, you know, mental to put on when you're sitting down to a plate because you kind of dive and you dig in and you feel, you realize a lot of the things that happened when you were a kid or the, the conversations or the environment around food when you were a kid are now things that you brought into adulthood. And so now there's a new terminology called mindful eating. And um, Bond teaches a lot about this and just being present with the plate, if you will. No distractions, you know, because we live in a world of them. So no TV, don't sit to music, don't sit to different things, but just actually be mindful. It's called intuitive eating. What is on your plate? enjoying the actual experience, tasting the food, smelling it, all those different things. So that goes cross culture, right? This is now a relationship with food. Um, so we have to learn how to either retrain our taste buds and just, just appreciate the food for what it really is. Because if you've ever really tasted an apple, not an apple, sorry, a, a, a tomato from the garden compared to tomato at the store, it's so different. Like your whole light bulb of um, infusions and taste buds just go crazy. So just understanding the experience and welcoming that, you know, we didn't grow up overnight. So therefore our taste buds and our relationship with food is now to be readjusted slowly, just as well as it was developed. Okay. And 
to understand cultural in a space like say my plate. I, I'm happy to announce that that Vaughn has actually created a resource for the BIPOC community um, with the grant with Dairy Council of California. And it talks about all the different type of introduction foods from baby, you know, talking about breastfeeding, because you know I'm a wick, a wick lady, talking about, you know, breastfeeding to the first introductory foods and then to toddlers, you know, the picky eaters, but what does that really mean? Like all those things. And it's culturally appropriate. So it has like, you know, the cheesy grits or whatever, like, you know, different recipes that resonate to the BIPOC community. So those type of things are again new and it's and it's again we're getting on the bandwagon and we're moving forward and I'm so happy to be in the places and to represent um different underrepresented communities there's uh, I think a Hispanic one there's an Asian um resource that people can use for that as well feeding their infants and toddlers um I will share that with you Ayan I'm sorry I don't have the link to that one but um it is really really cool I would have to say not just because I worked on it myself but it really is a representation of the culture and the community. Yeah, Angela, I was going to say, I would love to see that as well, um, just because our nutrition educators on our end um, do a lot of work around my plate too. So to have one that is really uh, ingrained in, you know, cultural connectedness, I think is really important. Um, and the, you know, question that you asked Ayana about relationship to food, it's just so personal. So it's like, I, I don't know if I could really say like, this is what I recommend for people to have their relationship with food, because it's just, it's just your own. Um, I really loved Angela, what you talked about, like tasting a tomato from a garden is so different than like buying a tomato. And I think that's something that we all could work on is uh, like, how are we connecting with our food? Not just when we're eating. So I love the mindful eating, but like, do we know where our food is grown? Have we seen our food be grown? Um, and I think like us as a society as a whole have gotten so disconnected from food itself. Um, you know, Melissa, you've talked about TikTok and people posting on TikTok. Like that's, I think, further really um, just uh, disengaged us from like, what is it that we're actually eating? What is it that we're actually taking a photo of rather than it's just content, but it is something that was grown that somebody put love and labor into growing the carrot and then making that carrot into a beautiful dish. I think that's something that I would love for us as a society to like look at in terms of our relationship with food, but also Another thing, I guess, on a more personal level that I've tried to work through is, um, you know, talking about what is good versus bad. I think we assign a lot of morality behind food and like food doesn't exist to be like a good or a bad thing. It it, it just is what it is. And I think we as humans dictate whether something is good or bad, if that makes any sense at all. And I think it's really about um, you know, the assigning the morality of like, I've eaten something good, I've eaten something bad, um, further really like um, instills judgment within ourselves and to other people of like, well, I wouldn't eat that because I think that burger is a bad thing to put in your body, right? And I think that really further kind of, um, I don't know the word, but separates us um, further, uh, I don't know, causes uh, this disconnection within ourselves about the food that we've just, you know, consumed and put into our body. So I think that's something that I'm trying to think about on a personal level um, around like, why do we assign morality? Why do we assign goodness? Why do we assign badness to the things that we eat and that we're surrounded by? Um, that that's so so awesome just to hear you guys talk about that. Obviously, I'm not a nutritionist or a dietitian, but um, Melissa, you said something earlier that really reminded me of something. I somebody recently has been telling me to listen to my body, and um, so I don't eat anything fried, and it's not because I feel like it's not good for me. It's simply because every time I eat something fried, I get nauseous, like I feel like I want to throw up or something. So um, I kind of try to listen to my body in that sense. And, you know, like, like you said, it was, um, you know, eating a burger, right? When the, it's how it's prepared, what you have in it. But for me, that's how I kind of base how I eat. Like, you know, the oil kind of makes me feel sick. Um, I 
don't eat beef anymore, but, you know, if I have to eat a burger, I try to do it at home, that kind of stuff, you know, just try to do the best I can. I think that um, there are little things that people can do to kind of look after their, themselves and, and listen to their bodies and, you know, just try to treat everybody. That's my small piece because, you know, I'm not qualified to speak on this, but I can only tell you how I feel about my body. <laughs> Every everyone has a relationship with food, so you know your opinion is just as valid. So thank you, thank you, Rick. I want to validate you in this space. <laughs> oh, um, and Melissa, did you have anything to add, or did you already? I mean, I know I'm kind of like in the discussion. Right now. Uh, no, I mean I, I added a little bit, but I, I guess I would just say, um. I guess I would just say that um, I feel like there is also a piece where I feel like there's a perception of being able to think about dietary restrictions or what you can eat, what you can't eat um, is a privilege because some folks, they don't have that choice um, or their choices may be limited. And so it may seem frivolous to think about like, well, I'm not going to decide like, oh, I'm cutting out this element of my diet. Like I just need to get what I can get. And that's real. And that kind of touches like full circle back on food justice as far as what's available in your neighborhood. How easy is it, uh, is it to access these, um, a wider variety of elements that, that could comprise your diet. Um, but again, like it's not to say that, uh, as Elisa said, like, oh, you have to, you can't have a preconceived idea of this is what good food is. And if I don't consume that, then that is bad and I am bad. No, you have to make the best choices for yourself, listen to your body and um, just be aware of it and, and see see what you can do. And yeah, it's, it's all part of a, a larger system. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um... Yeah, because I always feel like the relationship piece is so important because I think sometimes we don't even like recognize what that relationship is. I think we just, you know, we eat because we have to because, you know, it's how we, we stay alive. But looking at like those cultural pieces of whatever might come from like your your ethnic or racial identity down to, you know, the habits that were created from, you know, being a child and growing up. Right. I think all of that kind of dictates how we look at the space, whether you know, you have options or not, it, it definitely um, kind of, you know, fo is the lens, you know, the lens that focuses how you view the world when it comes to food. So I, I you know, to um, Elisa's point, um, that relationship is so personal, right? Um, but for each of us to make sure that we're, we're building a space for us to to learn for ourselves as individuals, the larger community, what that relationship looks like, I think that's really important. So thank you all, um, everyone, for kind of sharing um, your pieces when it comes to that relationship. Um, so when I do think about, um, you know, that piece and then going back to the conversation that we had, um, you know, with our um, guests in the audience, you know, I think about next steps, right? Because I know folks are excited they're saying, okay, I want to, you know, I want to get in touch with a nutritionist. I want to get in touch with a dietitian. I want to find these healthy food options. Um, what are some resources that you know of um, that folks can get in touch with today? Um, or do you know, or do you know how someone can go about getting access to maybe someone that could be on a care team whether that be one of the licensed or unlicensed um, professionals that we spoke about. And because I know a lot of folks may be like, okay, I want to, you know, I want to find all these folks to kind of help me build what this health journey looks like with food. Um, and in this food justice, you know, space, as we try to find resources from neighborhood to neighborhood. Um, but what are some things that you know that are available or how can people get in touch with the folks that can help them um, navigate that journey? You can start with Vital Connections. <laughs> Vital Connections is like a world of resource. There um, you go. Love that. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and just visiting some of the health fairs and some of the um, 
you know, the public appearances that Vital Connections has. I don't know if you can get on a newsletter about that, but when you go to those different events, uh, you, you can meet a lot of different people. And that's what I love about Vital Connections. They are connecting all of us um, so that it gives you that well-rounded type care. I also know of, you know, just, this is just within my own little circle. This It's so big, but Mattapan Food and Fitness Coalition is a really good place to um, to be involved if you're in the Mattapan area and they do everything. We're always connecting with them for the cooking and the, the food and nutrition part of it, but they do so much more um, like physical fitness, bike rides, and all those different things that connect the community, but also help you as an individual as well. And, you know, if, if you're, you know, able to access different things like food, uh, snap, sorry, uh, wick, all those different things also help a lot if you're el eligible for those things as well, because it opened up more doors. So if you have, say, for instance, snap, you can get free fruits and veggies um, through the HIP program because now all you have to have is a balance and then you can now access um, free fruits and veggies at the farmer's markets. Awesome. And thank you for the shout out. <laughs> yeah. I also wanted to talk about Vital Connections uh, food resource guide. It's um, that's a, that's a huge, that's a really big thing too. Um, you know, one of the things I think about, and I was having a conversation just uh, last night with somebody about the food resource guide and, um, and the fact that, so with fact we have uh we have about four different uh, food distribution sites. And you, you know, I know some uh, pantries where in order for you to get food, you have to show proof of um, address or that kind of stuff. And we just make sure we don't do that. If somebody shows up, they're actually hungry and trying to get some food. So uh, just one of the things, but the, the food resource guide is um, is actually awesome. And, you know, it's in about what, four different languages. So um, just, um, just kind of, I'm, I want to keep pushing that, you know, if you, people who are on here and, and you're looking for a, 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 to find food in your community, um, the Five Connections Food Resource Guide. Yes. Yeah, I've I've connected so many people to that uh, resource guide. It's really, really amazing. And um, Angela, I think you also dropped in the chat Project Bread, their food hunger hotline, which is also really great. Um, for the YMCA, we have a number of different organizations that we uh, provide food to where we distribute grocery bags. Um, and some of them, you know, do distribute out to the community. And I can drop the link. It's You can actually find it through the Greater Boston Food Bank website. But we also have our new mobile market food truck, which we're slowly rolling out into the community. Um, we don't ask, you know, any... I, personal identifying information questions. Um, it's a truck that allows people to kind of shop off of um, and get food at no cost. Um, and we have, uh, you know, we put produce as well as shelf stable goods as well on the truck. So I think those are also some resources that I wanted to highlight, but I'll drop the um, Greater Boston Food Bank and our mobile market schedule in the chat. Thank you. Looks like we we have yes, and thank you, Angela, for putting um, Project Bread in the chat. One thing I also want to raise up um, before I go to Carl, I appreciate the fact that right in the community, I love going to the Stop and Shop and Grove Hall because I know that they have someone on staff that um, is a nutritionist that helps kind of look at the layout of the um, of the store, so that way you have access to those foods right front and center you don't have to kind of like go into go around all the the honey buns to get to the good stuff so um and that's also when you think about um you know how you plan your your grocery shopping that's really important because they set it up in a way for certain things to be front and center so the fact that um that stop and shop is taking initiative to make sure that the healthy foods are front and center for people um, right in the community that um, that needs that access, considering the fact that, you know, what we put in our bodies is definitely tied to a number of, um, you know, health um, hurdles and health that a lot of people are experiencing, whether it be high blood pressure, diabetes and the like. So, I would say definitely take a look um, at the Stop and Shop and Grove Hall because I know it's set up in a way 
where you could definitely have um, a better shopping experience with getting healthy foods. Um, Diana, she's mm -hmm. a member of Bond, Christine Sinclair. She's the mm -hmm. nutrition, I mean, the dietitian there. And we yeah. sometimes run our uh, Cooking with Confidence classes in that room as well. Awesome. So see, another way to get in touch with Bond. So <laughs> see, yeah, I just want to say um, it's because of her that a lot of our members kind of learn how to shop when you go to grocery stores. Mm -hmm. She talks about reading uh, food labels and where to look when you go into the grocery store for the, for the best, you know, more, more nutritious food. And, you know, it's just, it was just so interesting. It was mind blowing. Yes, definitely. And always love daily table. I love the fact that, you know, they're very close to me. I go there for healthy foods. They have good, they have good deals. Um, of course, I know for um, the benefit with um, the snap benefits, so half off for your fruits and vegetables there, there's no cap on it. So if you are receiving, um, if you are receiving snap, that's a great way to, um, you know, save up and go to a place that's right in community. Um, so I saw, so I did see Carl's hand first. Carl, did you, did you want to speak still or are you okay? Okay. So then if, if you're okay, I'm going to go on to Leah. So Leah, I see your hands raised. Hi, <clears throat> good evening. Oh, I just wanted to mention about the Stop and Shop profile. They have that refrigerator there too. <clears throat> that you you go on the app and ahead of time and then you're able to you know get, get the stuff food out their fridge and it's discounted which i think is a, a good thing too yeah oh wow thank you thank you for sharing that leah you're quite welcome yeah so yeah see and this is what it's about right i feel as though a lot of folks share information and that's how we end up finding the things that we need all right so it looks like carl's having trouble unmuting uh if you can i could i could read your question for you if you're having trouble unmuting um just feel free to type it in the chat uh, and um I would say, and I do see another question in the chat about where um, I was just talking about, if you go to um, Daily Table, that is the space where if you have SNAP benefits, um, your your fruits and veggies can be half off and there's no cap to that. And they, I know that they um, took the cap off a, a couple months back. So it's a, been a really great um, resource for folks in the community. Um, okay. Wanted to, Carl had put in the chat, I just wanted to know if rounding the bases is in the resource guide. Um, I want to say no, but I can make sure that we include it. Um, uh, I think one thing that I always like to share with our uh, resource guide, we make sure that we're not only going off of what we know, we go off of what our panelists share here, and we also get information from you, right? I think we all are owners of a piece of the puzzle. So we'll definitely look into that to see how we can incorporate that into our um, list. So thank you for raising that up, Carl. So um, does anyone else have any other questions for our panelists? I want to make sure that we use this time together um, how you see fit. Um, you know, we've got... We got some movers and some shakers. We got a lot of folks who have been put into these new positions that I'm so excited about. Uh, so they're definitely helping with moving the work forward. So I want to make sure if you have any questions um, that you have the space to, to ask them now. Hi. Yeah. Hi, Charmaine. Yes. Hi. So I just wanted to mention like, um, you know, some foods, um, when come to your health, some foods may not be, some foods are, um, it's an acquired taste. And I just wanted to mention that, you know, some people like us as uh, human beings, you know, we need to, um, what is, what is good for us? That is the food that we don't like, or we will be like, yeah, we don't like it, but it's what good for us. And I wanted to mention another thing. When you go to the doctor, let's say you have an accident or something and you, you go to the doctor and a doctor have to make um certain decisions. So like maybe you have to do like a 
um, heart transplant or liver transplant. You know, they will observe your, 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 your records, your, you know, your records. So it's important that one take care of themselves. You understand? They observe everything and put certain priorities on, uh, based on how you how you live. You know, you, you know, how you, how your, um, you know, some people might have a smoking habit. Some people might have, you know, so all these things that you have to really look at, uh, we, us as human beings, I'm talking to myself as well, um, to really try to, um, take care of ourselves, like really, really try, um, to take care of ourselves. Um, I don't know if, uh, yeah, I think that's all I have to say because as for me, I, um, um, I had a surgery, uh, but a month ago and, um, it, everything went perfectly fine. There was, you know, there was nothing, um, everything was fine. So th these are one of the things that the doctor looks at your records, your health records. So in order to get a good health record, you need to, uh, try. We, as us as human beings, need to really try to, you know, to eat certain things. Like I will drink my clove tea. Yeah, and clove is clove is super powerful for all different ailments. You know, drink clove tea. Drink drink cinnamon tea. You understand? We need to go back to eat, and we need to go bush tea. You understand? That's all I have to say. I don't want to get too, <laughs> too um um. Yeah, that's all I have to say. Thank you for hearing me out. Yeah, no, thank you, Charmaine. I appreciate that. I love a good tea. And I know I've I've gotten quite a few um tidbits from folks that, you know, are in my family and my neighbors that tell me what to drink. <laughs> when it when, you know, if my stomach hurts, definitely drink this tea, that tea. And I feel as though tea is so essential and so underrated. So thank you for one, acknowledging that. But I appreciate you um bringing up the facts. It's just like coming back to like really being intentional right about um what we put in our bodies so thank you um anyone else i just want to say charmaine too thank you so much for saying that and this is how most people feel yet again you're you're one voice for the many in the community and this is again why bond teaches that again there's no good and bad food but the food that uh, that is considered healthy Everybody has it. They can always eat a healthy food and a healthy plate. And this is kind of what Bond teaches is not so much um, the food, but it's how we prepare it culturally. So once we get out of the idea that our food is unhealthy, we take that out, then we realize, oh, I, I eat, you know, healthy foods too, and I can eat them in a more healthful way. And as a couple of people here, I see Anthony, I see Sophie, I see a lot of people here that has taken, you know, cooking with confidence. And this is kind of, again, what we teach to recognize your own culture and appreciate the foods that you have in your own culture and, and prepare them in a healthful way. So, yeah, it's all important. It's all related too. so healthy bodies, healthy lifestyle. I like that. So. Is it. Is there anything that's on the panelists' mind? You know, I you know I always love to turn it over to you too, because I mean, look, it's a conversation, so I would love to know: is there anything that you know is a burning question for you, or something that might have sparked from you for this conversation? An aha moment, if you will. Well, I, I really enjoyed the question that you asked, as far as what do we see as gaps in food justice in the food system in Boston. And I would love to ask that question to the audience if there's anything that you feel like we did not cover as panelists, just from your own perspective, lived experience, anything that you feel like is a gap that we didn't address. Yeah, so yeah, I love that. Thank you for bringing that up, Melissa. If there's anything that um, you feel as though we might not have touched on tonight, uh, feel free, raise your hand, put it in the chat. Uh, we'll, you know, we're more than happy to make sure that we we talk about it here. I just wanted to say I came on a little bit late, but I always think that um, what you guys are doing, blessings, Angela, um, I always think that what you guys are doing is educating the community and knowledge is everything. And as for me, I try to eat healthy, exercise, and sleep because it's all good for the body. Thank you for sharing. Thank you, Sophia. Yes, sleep. Big sleep. Capitals. 
exclamation points very important <laughs> I also came on a bit late, but um, I find it very interesting, everything that you guys had said while I was here. And, um, also, um, I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. I have a neighbor who, her doctor told her she should go to a nutritionist, but she's scared to go because she thinks that the nutritionist is going to tell her everything that she eats is no good <laughs> because she likes a lot of you know the hispanic type of foods and stuff and a lot of we know a lot of these things are carb so <laughs> do you have any suggestions on what i can tell her to actually try to convince her to go <laughs> uh well i your how your neighbor feels is valid um i'm sure that it's based off of experiences i mean even what belinda shared earlier in this session is unfortunately not uncommon uh but the good thing is just because you get a referral to a dietitian or a nutritionist doesn't mean that you have to stick with that one you can shop around. You can find one who actually does listen to you um, and one who is responsive. Um, you should not. Uh, you should not find a dietitian that is. Um, it is actually part of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics um, ethos and, and uh, ethics policy to make sure that we're providing culturally responsive um, uh, interventions to folks that we meet. So you can't have a dietitian that looks like me and says, I'm sorry, I don't know about Hispanic food. Everything you eat is inappropriate. That's, that's not actually consultation. That's not helpful. So um, there are dietitians out there and nutritionists out there that should be able to offer guidance. And I mean, similarly for those who've ever had to like meet with a therapist, meet with a doctor, like you don't have to stick with that one. If you meet somebody for whatever reason, they just do not jive with your personality, by all means, go to somebody that you feel is actually listening to you. Um, and somebody who can um, be a coach and encourage you and help make guidance, but not discount you as you are when you walk into the door. Yeah, thank you for that. I know, um, I know that's very similar to an experience that I had with, um, you know, my care team. They said, I'm going to take you to, you know, we're going to re recommend you to a nutritionist. And yeah, I think it really depends on, you know, who you're seeing. Right. Um, and also, you know, like we all said, these relationships are personal, right? The relationship, the relationship you have with food, you know, your providers. So building your care team may take some time. It may, you know, the first person may not be the best fit. So it's also, um, you know, it's also an opportunity to say like, Hey, you know, let me see if there's someone else in the network that um that can kind of, you know, gel better with what I'm looking for um through a health experience. So, you know, I would always just keep that in mind that, you know, maybe not on the first try, but um you might find someone. And I think there's a lot of great um resources here that might help with the first steps of finding someone that may um be a little bit more um, relatable when it comes to that journey. So yeah. I just dropped it in the chat as well. A bond member of ours, her name is um, Sue Ellen. Um, she created, I believe it's a like a, a list of registered dietitians so that you can pretty much shop around through that. So reach out to her. She's at 360girlsandwoman.com. Oh, nice. Thank you so much. I know, because that's like the initial step. It's hard to encourage your friend or anybody who's dealing with diet-related diseases even because they're afraid. They're like, uh, I don't want to give up what I am used to and that comfort and that you know solace in the food that they like to eat. That's a, a really big step. So thank you for even looking out for her on her best interest. And I think once she begins to say, something has got to change and I'm not the expert. And I would love to have someone to give me some insight of what that actually is. 
she's kind of already taken the initial step. So good job being a good friend. <laughs> Teamwork definitely makes the dream work. All right. So I feel as though we've had a really good conversation. Um, I want to pose one more time to either the panelists or the um or our community members that are on with us if there's anything that you want to add to the space, a comment, a resource, a question. Um, you know. We're here all we're here to share because look, I look, I know I'm the <laughs> the facilitator of this conversation, but I've learned a lot. I've been taking notes this whole time. So everyone has something to learn here. So um just wanted to open that up one more time to see if there's anything that any like any, that anyone wants to add, any questions, anything that they've seen in the neighborhood. Um, you know, would love for you to share. And if you need time to ponder, what I think I'll do is, oh, I see Charlie's hand. Go ahead, Charlie. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Charlie. I'm the site director for Food Rescue US Boston. Thank you for including me in this lovely conversation. Um, I hear a lot of people who are taking steps on the next part of their journey. And um, I just want to say that everything that lives eats and we all eat in our own unique way. It's like a fingerprint. We all, food is so complex. It carries memories. It carries social implications. It carries uh, sometimes, you know, apartheid and unfortunately subjugation. And those are heavy weights. Um, I just want to encourage everyone to follow your path. I love the advice here that if you don't find a doctor or a nutritionist at first to work with you, go find someone else. Um, we've got a beautiful tapestry here of people and a, and a pretty stellar healthcare system in Boston. So um, don't give up, do persevere. And the other thing I wanted to mention is um, that I do, I, you know, a lot of people that I talk to in my work say, you know, people always say, oh, well, if you don't have money that makes you food insecure, but I don't think that's all there is to it. And I, and I have to lift that up because there are many barriers to food security and knowing how to cook is definitely one of them. Um, ha not having enough time is one of them because convenience foods and processed foods are always going to be not as helpful as something, even if you just put a chicken breast in a pan and make some rice and some broccoli it doesn't even have to have anything on it. It's going to be better for you than something you grab off a shelf. Um, and sorry, last point. Um, I get going and then I can't, you know, turn on this. So just mute me if I've said enough. But um, one of the things, you know, at, at my age, one of the things I've noticed is that learning to cook is a continuing journey. And we cook in different ways and different stages of our lives. And it's important sometimes to stop and just recognize, you know, for, for example, when I was young, I my mother never taught me how to cook. So I learned how to cook by going to culinary school. And then I went from not knowing how to cook for myself to knowing how to cook for hundreds of people at a time and still didn't know how to cook for myself. And then my journey through the restaurant business. And now I have children that I'm cooking for and they're going to leave. And then it's just going to be cooking for the two of us. You know, it changes over time. Nothing. The, change is the only constant. So I say to all of you, um, thank you for coming to this conversation. Thank you for including me. Don't give up on yourself. It is a journey. It's not a destination. Um, and food is joy and it's joy where we can find it. Thank you. Wow, I've got to give a slow clap <laughs> to Charlie. Thank you so much um, for sharing. I know um, I just want to say like Charlie, um, is a really great um, partner of, of MFAC. We appreciate everything that she contributes every time she speaks. So thank you so much uh, for bringing that into the space. Thank you, Jolly. Yeah. And you got a lot of love going on in the chat. So I feel like, I feel as though I know with our food work, we could go on and on. Um, and I feel like this might mean we might need a part two, you know, who knows? Well, We'll, we'll put a pin in that and come back to it. Um, but I definitely, you know, would love to like wrap up this conversation and pose um, 
one thing to each of the panelists here. Um, when it comes to looking at food justice in Boston, because we understand that there's a lot of great work happening, but there's a long road ahead for you know, access to food to be equitable and just. Um, you know, what are what is one thing that we could do um as community members, as leaders of these community organizations, as organizers, as advocates, as people who are passionate about our our nutrition, our health and the 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 community around us getting access to that food uh what is one thing um that you would advise this group to do as like their their action step what is the call to action for us all and i know it's a big it's a big task but thing you know i feel like everything starts with one step so um if there's one thing that you could um maybe like empower us to do to as a next step in this journey to support each other in this um, food justice journey, what would you say we should do? I, I would say it's it's easy. It's not. It's I mean it's I mean look at the work we've been doing together. I think the only thing I can say is for us to keep working together. We've reached some milestones. We've done some things that people never thought could be done, and um and that's because we collectively we kind of work together. Like everybody has the same. Um, we're, we're trying to reach the same goal. And so by working together with this group of people and, and others, um, I think we can we can do whatever we want to do, whatever needs to be done. So my, my advice is just to stick to it, stick together, continue working together. I would say, yeah, definitely, Rick. Collaboration is, I think, the goal and the key to how we find success in the work that we do. Um, I would say, I guess on a more personal level, you know, the term food system, the food ecosystem is just so broad. So I feel like if folks, you know, are feeling lost as to how to get started or get involved, maybe think about like, in what ways do you want to engage with the food ecosystem, food system? So whether it's from the production side, from the distribution side, like there's so many steps or so many points that you could get involved. So I think, you know, for yourself, like, what are you interested in? Are you interested in learning how to grow food? Are you interested in learning how to provide, you know, outreach and education materials to people so they can access food? Are you interested in um, volunteering to distribute food? So I think there's so many different access points, you know, like Rick said, there's a wide network of community organizations that are doing this work. So I think once you figure out at which point you want to enter the food ecosystem, then you can probably go from there and look into the amazing organizations that exist in Boston or outside of Boston um, that do that kind of work. Hey, Lisa, nicely said. I think I piggyback on Rick and what you just said. Um, the access, of course, trying to figure out which way, you know, you can best give your, uh, I guess, your time, if you will, and your passion. And you know, together is the way to go. So if you're involved in any community organizations, whether that's like even your town's um, community meetings, just kind of having your voice heard. I know a lot of people, um, they sometimes are hesitant in saying anything because they feel like their voice is unheard. But the more you say it, the more we say it together, the louder we are. So the more you talk about it, the things that, you know, you feel could contribute to a better healthful community. I mean, I, I don't find anything wrong with that. And I'm always advocate for getting in the garden. So I don't know if that's where you start, but I always, this is as soon as I move into a community, I'm like, where's the community garden? I wanna be involved. I wanna show my kids to be involved in the community garden where your food comes from. How timely with spring. I mean, I don't I don't have my seedlings in the background. That's downstairs. But yeah, very timely getting the dirt. Um, yeah, I echo everything that um, each of the panelists have, have said um, as far as working together towards the common goal. And I guess the only piece that I would add um, is one of my favorite quotes from Shirley Chisholm, where if you uh, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. So like if you feel like there are places where your voice is not being heard or you're being excluded, pull up anyways. Um, let yourself be heard. Um, and I.
You on mute? You got muted, Melissa. <laughs> That's weird. Sorry. Um, not sure where it dropped off, but I will say that um, if at any point um, you are in your community and you notice something that you feel like um, you need resources or you have a question, something you want to address, I just dropped in the chat um, the uh, email address for the Office of Food Justice, which is very easy. It's just food at boston.gov. So if there are ever any questions or that you have or something that you've noticed that you would like to be addressed, that's a great way where even if OFJ, if we can't answer that question directly, we have this wonderful network of partners where we can connect people in the community where they might be able to get assistance. Look, I need to put pull up anyway on a t-shirt. I think that's <laughs> that's the battle cry for tonight. But thank you so much um, to the four of you and, and the cat. Can't forget the cat. I feel like that's our mascot for tonight. Uh, <laughs> but thank you um, all so much for um, sharing your wisdom and your experience with us um, and really helping us think about kind of where we are right now as a city and how we can start to take steps as individuals. So again, you know, so much gratitude to you all and to all the community members that joined us here tonight. Um, I do know with this event, just like others, um, every time we have a community convo, we will be following up with you with a recap of this event here. So if you ever want to listen back, then maybe somebody says something like, ah, I got to go back to it. You will receive uh, the the copy of this for, for you to um, continue to watch on your own. Also, we will be sharing our, our resource guide. We have been taking notes on some of the things that have been shared tonight. So we're going to make sure that um, those things that we've captured, as well as some of the, the information that we have from our panelists and from our NFAC group here of Vital Connections, that we make sure you have access to that all. Because we always want to say, we want to, you know, hand, hand you the tools so you can be a part of the solution. So uh, feel free to look out on your emails for that. That'll be forthcoming. Otherwise, there's a number of ways to get in um, contact with us. I know um, with the registration, we did give you the option to sign up for our newsletter. And that's a really great opportunity, one, to know what's going on with NFAC um, and what, what's going on with Vital Connections at large. We have a number of partners here, do a lot of great work in the food space, maternal health, cardiometabolic wellness, which we also call community wellness. So that's physical activity. You know, what does it look like to have clinical care, finding your care team, reducing stress and getting, get moving, right? These are going to be all the things that are going to help us combat a lot of the diseases and issues that are plaguing a number of communities here because they're compounded when it comes to access and how things have been designed. So we want to make sure here at Vital Connections and with all of our partners that you have the tools that you need to be a part of the solution, whether that's making a healthier you for yourself and your family or for lending yourself to bigger causes and supporting some of these organizations that are doing great work. So we look forward to um, engaging with you all. Feel free to um, reach out to me, um, ayana at vitalconnections.org. Um, if you have any questions or any aha moments, I'm more than happy to make sure that we get you connected to the folks here um, on the panel or some of our great partners that have popped in throughout the evening. And then also before we go, I have to shout out my awesome colleague, intern Marky, uh, Marky Antonio. Um, he's been great with um you know, getting a number of things um, going when it comes to talking to um, our panelists and coordinating some of the great slides that you saw today. Um, Marky, not to, <laughs> I'm going to bring you up here on the virtual stage so that everyone can see you, but I just wanted to shout out Marky for all of his great work. So um, with that, everyone, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, check out your emails. There's a lot of great information coming, um, including what you've heard tonight and a little bit more. So you all have a great evening. I hope you find a great plate of something warm or cold if, if that's what you want. Um, but I hope that you all um, have a good one. Okay. All right. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ayana. Thanks, Thanks Marky. Good night. Have a great night. Bye. Thank you. Good night.